Hello, and welcome to my presentation on organizing Terraform code. My name is Sorin Lacrizano, and I'm going to talk to you about a simple tool I've been using for making my life much easier when using Terraform. I've been an SRE with Adobe for the past six years. I love all automation, especially Terraform, and I'm the guy that's in this case, literally behind the Git Manage project you see here from GitHub. I tend to be quite thorough in my work, so I often plan for the long term. This was also the case when I was getting started with Terraform, and I invested in a same workflow before introducing any code to my team. So what are we going to talk about? I'm going to start sharing some of the problems I was facing. Now, why write a tool anyway? Then I'm going to describe what my tool brings to the table in terms of functionality. Next, you'll get some insights on what other benefits you will get from using this wrapper, followed by a recorded demo. Finally, you'll receive my personal take on why I think you should try this before we can get to the Q&A portion where I would love to hear your questions and thoughts. All right, first things first. What are the common problems that we face when getting started with Terraform? Here is a list of issues, or as I would call them, our deepest desires, that many of us in the industry needed to solve at some point before getting our team on board. First off, we don't want to write duplicate code. Then we aim to reduce potential splash radius. We want to use Terraform to its full potential so we can chain modules together by logical remote state references. We want standard workflows and recognizable repository structures. It would also be best to avoid long and uh, error-prone commands during our workflow. It's always a good practice to adopt common and predictable naming conventions. Now, naming stuff is pretty hard, and without good names, finding stuff is even harder. Last but not least, having a clearly written and easy-to-follow documentation it's is what keeps teams sane, organized, and flexible to bring in new members at a lower cost of onboarding. Now, let's see what the wrapper actually provides. First off, it enforces the adoption of a certain folder structure. It's really a basic split between modules that you write once and share across environment. And then you have an environment folder where you organize the different inputs that each product requires for any given environment. Now let's look at this into more detail. In the repository root, the wrapper expects to find this .dfm configuration file. It is where you can specify the relative folder paths for modules and environments. This is useful for onboarding an existing repository, which might require a custom path, but I would recommend uh, start with a fresh repository with the default values for your first experience. Next, you have the modules directory, which contains a folder for each root module. You can, of course, reference as many child modules as you want, be that locally from subfolders or another folder besides modules and environment, say, vendor, or even better, reference them remotely. But uh, nested root modules are not supported for better consistency across projects. Finally, we have the environment folder. And you will probably notice that we first list product folders. Now, as a sign note, in my personal experience, when working on services which are comprised of multiple and similar microservices, it is not worth managing multiple repositories for the infrastructure. So they end up in the same one. Now, these product folders contain environment folders. And under each environment, you'd have a folder that matches the module name. Finally, you have what I call the component layer, uh, which are really multiple instances of the same module in the same environment. This could maybe, uh, this could be maybe role types for similar compute resources, or maybe different network types. It is your choice how you decide to organize around this layer. Now, the second solution that the wrapper provides is a custom interface to use instead of the default one. This aids you in using the folder structure that we've been discussing. As you can see here, the focus is on the what. So 
reading left to right, we ask ourselves, what product am I targeting? Which repository am I in right now? And you'll see why this uh, is relevant later. Which module do I want to interact with? What environment do I want to provision my resources to? And which variation of the module am I targeting? Finally, what Terraform command am I running? This is a wrapper after all. So after providing all the input, the script does some basic checks for you. It switches to the correct execution folder. It builds your Terraform command and it runs it for you. Now let's step back a bit and think about what life looked like before using my tool, using bare Terraform with our proposed folder structure. Now I am assuming that most people have a similar folder structure. So the pain points described here should strike a note with you as well. Let us take the following example scenario. We want to run Terraform apply for a module called manage firewall in a development environment for the bastion host role of the service dash A microservice. We would first need to change our working directory to the module folder. I think people prefer to do this instead of messing around with another Terraform plan. Then I am also assuming that you want to use Terraform workspaces. Now, it's perfectly fine if you don't, but in that case, you'd need to find another way of making your Terraform TF state keystring unique enough for your remote state configuration. I think it is safe to assume that all production setups is a form of remote state for team collaboration. I also get why you might think workspaces would be an overhead, but they don't have to be. Now, more on that later. Now, circling back to our workspace command, you probably want to adopt a naming convention. This is the one I propose for my projects because it's generic enough to not collide with names used across teams and projects. But in our manual workflow, there is nothing to enforce or correct any mistakes, and typing in that long string by hand is certainly error prone. But let's move on to the final part of the workflow. The Terraform command. You will also be building this by hand, which is really another chance to introduce human error. And just notice how the various elements also found in the workspace name here appear in a different order. So you might argue, why don't I just parameterize all of this to eliminate some of the human error? Like so. Well, I'd say you'd be right to do this and also off to a good start to coding your very own Terraform wrapper. Now, this is what mine looks like. And this is an example of a readme file that your team members might find for a Terraform project managed by my wrapper. They will be met by concise documentation. And if you are aiming for identical environments and you should, the documentation will also reflect that. In this example, I am suggesting that team members should in the environment and role through variables in the terminal. And then I suggest to copy and paste the command for each module to reflect the order in which they need to be deployed. So having the last command for parameterized as shown will enable intuitive execution of scenarios like these. I want to init the firewall module for a bastion host role in a dev environment. Then I want to run the apply command for that. Next off, I think I'll move to the stage environment, and this will force me to explicitly change the exported variable for my new environment. Then maybe I start off with an entirely different role from that. As you can see, this makes for a pretty clean workflow. So what else did we get from adopting this new tool? Well, we get an overall boost on quality of life when interacting with Terraform. Our file and folder paths are built and validated for us. The same goes for Terraform arguments like var file. We also have batch completion for improved local operator efficiency. And workspaces are also managed for us more on that during the demo. We also managed to enforce and adopt a standard folder structure. Our documentation is now more clear and reproducible across environments. And as a bonus, we can use the remote state in a predictable way. This ties into the standard workspaces, which are, as I said, managed by the tool. But let's dive in on that last point for a bit. Here's a sample configuration for remote state backend managed by Amazon S3. 
What you'll notice here is that the entire code snippet is a drop-in by default, and there is no need to mess around with the key or bucket name in order to separate state files for various environments and modules. Now, why is that? Well, it's due to the use of Terraform workspaces. The workspace name gets prepended automatically to the state file key as a folder in the case of S3. So whenever you select a different workspace, the state file will be linked to that. Now to complete the example, this would be the drop-in code snippet for reading the remote state of an upstream Terraform stack. Again, all of this is static. All you need to worry about is to build a workspace variable in a way that matches your targeted upstream stack. And since you may end up using this quite a lot, it only makes sense to reduce the duplicated code by wrapping this logic inside the Terraform module, like so. Now we can focus on building the workspace metadata and we don't have to worry about the central container for the remote state. This also makes refactoring much easier and adheres to our main desire to keep our code dry. Now we can proceed to the demo. You will see the tool in action and understand how workspaces are managed on your behalf. For this demo, I'm going to show you a sample project that creates infrastructure in AWS from scratch. The project actually starts even before creating any resources in AWS with a couple of special modules for registering and allocating network address space. We use our WordPress uh, naming convention to power this functionality. First off, under the network engineering project, we have a global address reservation book. This could very well be in a separate repository managed by a different team. To target this resource stack, I'm going to start typing the required parameters and use the path completion to help me fill in the command quick and error free. So I type tf and double tap tab, tab key, and I'm given a choice of products. I choose Netlink to continue. Then the repository is prefilled automatically, and now I get a choice of which module to run. Since this is a global environment, the rest of the parameters autofill with ease. Now we choose a Terraform command and hit enter. All right, so what happened here? After validating my inputs, the wrapper automatically selected the workspace for my stack. And then in ran apply command in Terraform. And these are the outputs that we got. So what's next? A VPC will have multiple subnets defined. So the next module will do exactly that. Only this time, we don't really type them in manually. We are calculating them. So if we move on to the allocate network variable files, in order to load the correct source cider, we use our stack metadata. This is our product environment and component. As you can see in the recording, the address reservation book on the left has labels based on the metadata components on the right. So now I can target my dev environment and start calculating the subnet allocations. Right, we will define a VPC of this size. We only need one. We've got private subnets, we mentioned their size and how many we want, and so on and so forth for the other types of subnets. Now, since I have a README document, I don't waste time typing, I just follow the procedure. And I copy and paste the command and I run it right away. But first I set the environment that I'm targeting and there it goes doing its thing. Okay, so we get a lot of information here that is stored in no resources in the remote state. 
But uh, what we're interested in is a CIDR allocation data, which is later used. And we can filter the outputs as you normally would. So now we have outputs to export to our product specific and environment specific data. Now you can guess what happens next. We can finally create AWS resources with the next module called Create Network. Now notice my inputs don't include any details about the subnets, availability zones and all that because they are all being calculated or referenced from upstream modules. Okay, so finally, let us create our AWS resources. I already have AWS credentials. All I need to do is execute the next module. You will notice this is the first time I execute a command. So the workspace did not exist before. I am given a prompt to create one and it is selected for me and the Terraform execution continues on my behalf. Now we can double check the expected information is in the plan. So we got the VPC CIDR that we expected from the first module and it matches up. We see that our public subnets are of the expected size and count. And we feel confident that we are, we are creating the correct resources in the correct workspace. So we let Terraform carry on and let it do its thing. So now that is creating and we're going to skip all of the waiting part. Now, there is just one more thing I wanted to show you. Let's see what happens when we type the command workspace list. Waiting for my record self to catch up. <laughs> All right, so let's, what you got here is a bird's eye view of your entire infrastructure that uses the same remote state bucket. This is really nice because you can get a pretty good idea of what's out there. You, know, you, you are free to grab it, filter it, and so on. It's a good way of getting a summary of everything you manage in Terraform across clouds and service providers. This concludes our demo. So in closing, I'd like to provide a few of my insights. Now with this tool, it is now very easy for me to manage large projects or get started with new ones. Now, I've tapped into the power of standard workspaces to enable custom modules that are linked between each other via remote state. Now, when projects get started, you are probably not ready yet to invest in CI/CD. So in order to get a good head start and use this wrapper to keep things organized, before the GitOps bots take over your Terraform execution. Now, as a bonus, your work will already be bot-friendly through the use of a standard structure and naming convention. Now, finally, good documentation is essential in any team. I've had examples of engineers who had never used Terraform before. They went through the documentation and managed to deploy resources on their own by the end of the day. Now, by the same standards of any team member, I find that pretty powerful. That is all I had to show you. You can find the project on GitHub. Now, any form of feedback is very, very welcome. Be it an issue post, a feature request, a pull request, anything. I've also left some links where you can contact me on social media if you have further questions. Now, thanks for having me here. I'm open to any questions you might have.